Today on the Beyond the Byline podcast, the EU will allocate 87 million euros and resources to Egypt for a migration management project in 2024. Why is this project of importance? How is the EU going to implement it? And can the union ensure that the funds will be allocated where is necessary? I am Evi Chiori. Welcome to your Beyond Beyond the Byline podcast. The EU plans to allocate 87 million euros and new equipment to Egypt under the umbrella of its migration management project in 2024, following a project initiated in 2022. The funds may increase to 110 million euros after an EU-Egypt Association Council meeting on January 23rd, Euractiv reported. While negotiations also involve tying funding for various sectors to international monetary fund reform requests, the focus is on enhancing Egypt's naval and border capabilities for surveillance, search and rescue at sea. Previous funding supported border management, anti-smuggling efforts and voluntary returns. But how is the EU planning to implement this project and how can it ensure that the funds will be allocated where is necessary? There will be allocated resources, broadly speaking, across five main areas, border management, anti-smuggling, anti-trafficking, voluntary return and reintegration of return migrants. Andrew Geddes is director of the Migration Policy Centre at the European University Institute. Those will be the themes, but Civipol, in particular the French, will be responsible for uh, in reinforcing capacity of Egyptian Navy around, and border guards around search and rescue. This is part of the wider externalization agenda that the European Union has been pursuing already for some time that basically aims at engaging neighboring countries to contain migration and asylum in exchange of other interests and policies, and in this case, funds. Sergio Carrera is Senior Research Fellow focusing on EU migration policy at the Center for European Policy Studies. This follows the model that uh, the European Commission has implemented uh, in other instances like Tunisia, which is basically aimed at uh, precisely this, basically making it uh, very difficult for people who are legitimately seeking asylum in Europe to do so. One thing is what uh, will be laid down in the letter of the arrangement with Egypt, and another matter is how this will be implemented. Um, how this money is going to serve the purpose and how to guarantee, uh, the key question for us is also, how to guarantee that these funds will not be misused, meaning that uh, based on the the experience also with Tunisia and other countries, uh, how to guarantee that the governments are not actually using these funds to backslide on rule of law and democracy and uh, human rights violations. So then we have to ask, does the EU have a mechanism in place to ensure that these funds will be distributed where is necessary and the organizations profiting will abide by the rule of law? Well, at the moment, the way in which the monitoring, there is no independent monitoring of how these funds actually are to be spent and in practice how to safeguard that these uh, finances, there is EU taxpayers' money, basically, are not misused for other purposes. And, and again, the call for these countries to manage migration disregards the risks that this entail for creating insecurity in the country, uh, the work of civil society and NGOs that are working with migrants and asylum seekers, and also mistreatment of asylum seekers uh, in a context where migration is increasingly criminalized also uh, in these in the same countries. Now, on January 23rd, there is the EU-Egypt Association Council meeting. So what does this meeting signal and what can we expect? It's basically already sealed. Uh, there's a significant agreement on it. There's a, a letter from uh, the Commission President von der Leyen to heads of government last October, which went into quite significant detail about the plans to work with Egypt. I think that what we're talking about here is an agreement on this amount of money, the 87 million euros, and then plans to further extend the cooperation. I think the Commission has presented this as a success, which I very much question. What has been agreed under the pact is extremely problematic, uh, not only from a human rights perspective, because we can expect that the expansion of border procedures across EU external borders is going to lead to more detention of people, more mistreatment of people, 
uh, including vulnerable groups, but also, frankly, does not uh, allow or foresee equal sharing of responsibility among all EU member states when it comes to assessing asylum in Europe. So it sends a very, you know, negative message regarding the European Union contribution to uphold refugee protection and human rights globally. And what measures would you recommend and what do you estimate the EU will set in place to manage migration and how effective would these measures be? This is not just a question of policy choice, it's a legal obligation that people that are seeking refuge in Europe must be granted the possibility to effectively do so. And sadly, you know, this is not the case. And the Pact on Migration and Asylum continues uh, towards that direction, making it extremely complicated for people who have, uh, who are fleeing conflict for people who are forcedly displaced to reach safety in Europe. Uh, the expansion of border procedures um, have been proven to be extremely inefficient, particularly because they actually increase the responsibility of uh, you know, EU member states holding the EU external borders. Um, they will need to put more resources there, but also indirectly um, giving the green light to detaining people um, in EU external borders, including families, minors. I mean, is this really humane? Is this really the direction that uh, the European Union wants to take? Is this really compatible with EU values laid down in the treaties? These EU values are not an empty shell. Human rights are not an empty shell. The rule of law, the same. We are seeing pushbacks uh, systematically carried out uh, across several uh, member states, um, including sometimes physical violence against people who are trying to just reach Europe because they don't have the possibility to make it legally. So in terms of policy solutions, we need to ensure legal uh, avenues for people to travel uh, regularly, uh, to revise our visa policies, which make it extremely complicated for people who flee, who need to flee um, their countries to do so in a legal way. Based on uh, available statistics by UNHCR, it is very clear that, uh, you know, a majority of refugees do not come to Europe. There is a misperception that everybody wants to come to Europe to abuse the system. This is false. And uh, what we know from data is that when there are conflicts, people are mainly internally displaced in the country or they just move to the neighboring country. They don't continue their journeys unless they really have to. There are kind of two sides to what we refer to as migration management. And the EU is very focused on one side of the debate, which is the kind of prevention element, prevention, restriction, deterrence. Uh, and the agreement on the pact really reflects this focus on prevention, deterrence, restriction. Uh, the other side of the coin is, 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 is evident within almost all of the documents. If you dig into what's going on at EU level and really look into it, you'll see that there's quite often reference to what are sometimes vaguely referred to as legal pathways or regular pathways. So I think there is a recognition that a focus on prevention alone is unlikely to be effective unless you also have some uh, availability of legal or regular pathways for migration to the EU, which could be beneficial for the sending countries, for the migrants themselves, and also because of labour market gaps for EU member states. And would you say that the war in Gaza has an influence on this decision and action by the EU, especially because according to the EU's Asylum Agency's 2023 migrant report, there have been almost no irregular departures from the Egyptian coast since 2016, as most migrants choose Libya as their departure point. So, what factors influence this decision? Egypt has been in the radar of the European Commission for some time. And it is true that statistically, even if the numbers may not be very high, this uh, has not prevented the European Commission to pursue negotiations on readmission and migration management with the Egyptian authorities. But, uh, you know, the fact that this is indeed now presented once more as a priority after what has happening, what is happening, and as a way to perhaps send a message that indeed uh, it will be extremely difficult 
or basically the job for the Egyptian authorities would be to make it extremely difficult for people seeking asylum in European territory to do so. Indeed, I think we need to read it in that context, hmm? where some EU member states' ministries of interior continue to, in a very unreasonable way, to be extremely concerned that you know asylum seekers from the Middle East reach Europe, in contrast uh, with you know refugees from other countries like Ukraine. Egypt is a particular case. Egypt, as we know, there's a lot of domestic problems. Uh, Egyptian citizens as may have grounds for quite significant discontent because of the economic and political situation in the country, uh, and there's uh, a fragile security situation as well. Now, this is a very important development because we're heading to the June parliamentary elections and the forecast shows that the far right uh, has a significant rise and that can actually be translated to more seats in the EU parliament. And migration will be one of the hot topics of the EU's agenda. So how do you see this matter developing? The elections in June are also quite closely linked to the agreement on the pact on migration and asylum, the agreement the member states were able to meet, to reach just before uh, just before Christmas. And so there, there are five regulations that were agreed before Christmas on the screening of arrivals, on what's called the Eurodac information system, a kind of database on containing fingerprints and biometric identifiers, uh, a regulation on asylum procedures, and a, and a regulation on asylum management, and also a, a kind of crisis or force majeure regulation. So I think in a way what we see now is a race against time to get those to enact these regulations, to secure the agreement on these regulations. But And there are still some tensions around some aspects of that, particularly around asylum and migration management and ideas about sharing of responsibility and solidarity. So I think one of the key issues here is that this agreement was represented as a way to kind of head off the radical populist anti-immigration political parties in the run-up to the European Parliament elections. Yet at the same time, uh, there are still quite significant uh, areas of disagreement between the member states. And you know, a pre-election time is not always the best moment in which to seek agreement between you know, diverse political groupings you know, who are you know, looking at the elections rather than necessarily wanting to reach agreement with each other. There is a lot of concern about the far right gaining ground. These may be indeed very legitimate concerns. We have, in fact, the far right already in some EU governments, and they are also indeed taking positions in other member states. So we shall see what happens also in national elections. But I believe really that at the European Union level, any decisions that are made in the area of migration, they cannot be driven by fear of um, you know, certain political families in Europe that are still here. And irrespective of the lessons learned from history, recent history, we should not come back to them to make decisions that actually nurture some of the agendas that these extreme right parties are actually supporting or taking up their narrative. And by this, I mean center or, you know, different political families adopting far-right agendas and making migration policy a salient policy issue instead of other matters that matter much more. And this is where the EU pact, the current agreement on the EU pact comes um, and needs to be read in that light, that um, who wins with these policies? Who wins with this narrative that dehumanizes certain people based on purely on their status, putting them the label of migrant, and treating them as if they are not human anymore. Have we learned anything from history about this? Thank you very much. I am Evicioori, and this was your Actives Beyond the Byline podcast. Visit your Actives to stay on top of the latest news, sign up to our podcast newsletter, and if you haven't subscribed to the podcast, you can do so on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever it is that you're listening to your podcast. Thank you for tuning in, and until next time. As part of our commitment to accuracy, inclusion and transparency, Euractiv is part of the Trust Project.